so that's the sun god of dawn, and then the sun god of daytime is usually just Ra, or sometimes Ra Horakti, which means Ra of the two horizons. Uh, and so you can kind of understand where that comes from, because it's Ra in between the uh, setting and the, and the rising sun. Uh, and he's often depicted either just as uh, a sun beast or with a falcon head. Um, and then it has allusions to Horus, of course, but you know, the falcon is uh, you know, a, god, a bird associated with well, the bird, so it's associated with the sky. Uh, and these birds are used often to conceptualize things having to do with the sky. And then you have Ra of the evening, um, the kind of older, weaker Ra. Ra who is about to go to the underworld, who, who is going to you know, metaphorically die. Uh, he's often shown with uh, a ram's head. I'm not entirely sure why or if we know the reason for that. Um, but he's the, he's, the, he's the weakening one, the older one, who is going to go under the, into the underworld, but he's going to rise again the next day uh, and begin again as the new sun. So, uh, right, so the sun then re represents the power of the creator in this world. Now, so after the first sunrise, after this has all happened, oh wait, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Oh, right, I wanted to show you this for fun. So I'm going to turn off the lights for a second so you can really see all the <coughs> awesomeness of what's going on here. Um, so a couple of you asked me afterwards yesterday about pictures and illustrations of the gods and so, and so forth. And so I've tried to include a bit more of those, although some of these gods don't really have very good illustrations. But what I wanted to show you is that there's actually a lot of variety in Egyptian iconography. Um, and, and sometimes it has to do with differences in time, and sometimes it just has to do with different ways of wanting to express metaphorically the nature of the god. So this is a papyrus from a later period in Egypt's history, from the late period. Uh, it's, a, it's a spell, a protective spell uh, from scorpion and snake bites, especially for women. And you've got two gods here kind of in their somewhat protective forms. One is Bess, who is well known as a kind of demon who protects women and children, especially women who are pregnant or are giving birth. Uh, and then you have uh, this fantastic representation of Autumn. And he's represented as a snake, uh, an anthropomorphized serpent, right? So he's got human legs and uh, human arms. And then he's holding a sun disc with a child in it, which presumably, at least from the description, sounds like it's supposed to be then, you know, the, the newborn son. So he's holding himself, <laughs> essentially. Uh, one form of himself is holding another form of himself, which seems to be a reference of him being self-created, right? And so the serpent, why the serpent? S serpents are associated with marshes, with, with water. Um, and so it's probably an allusion to the primordial waters. In some traditions, these are represented as having a differentiation of forces, which are then represented as different types of aquatic animals. Uh, so this seems to maybe be a reference to that. And a serpent can be a source of danger, um, but what do you do to fight something that's dangerous? It's kind of that fight fire with fire mentality. So you can fight a snake with a snake, or with at least the power of a snake. Um, and so it's all, I, I put this up here because it's, it's easy to think that, or this is a misconception that this is how the Egyptians visualize the gods as they really are. And it's not. The images are just metaphors as well to express ideas about the nature of gods. It's not that they think that Ra in the morning really walks around like a person with a beetle head, and that's his true form. It's not. This is just a representation um, of his essence, uh, visualized to make it more accessible uh, to people. So. Right. Before we go on, though, to the reign of Ra, um, I wanted to tell you about, very, very briefly, another alternative version of the creation, um, especially because it's, it's, it relates closely uh, to um, biblical uh, uh, biblical tales of the of the creation. And this is the Memphite theology. So it's based. It, it comes from the priest of Memphis. Uh, here's a map to show you where it is. You can also see where Heliopolis is. Um, Memphis was, I think as I mentioned yesterday, oftentimes a center of power, of political power, in, in Egypt. And they seem to have their own tradition that emerges as well. And the city god of Memphis was Ptah. 
He's a very, very old guy, as far as we can tell. And he's associated with craftsmanship, with creativity, uh, especially um, like metal workers and architects mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of thing. And it seems that there develops, at least in the kind of um, the Memphite school of thought, of a deep link between Ta and the creation of the world. And we have a version of it recorded in a text from the 8th century. And what we see is that this text alludes to the Heliopolitan version, but it gives Ta primacy. And it also presents a more intellectual version of the creation, as opposed to the physical version of the creation coming directly from Adam's you know, fluids. Uh, and represents creation as an act of rational thought and speech. So I put up here a few of the lines from the text. And it starts out this way. This is the, these are the first lines. Through the heart and through the tongue, something developed into Autumn's image. And great and, and important is Ta, who gave life to all the gods and their cause as well. So remember, the Ka is the, is the, divine, uh, the divine energy of the spirit. So Ata, what he's saying here is that Tom, uh, Atom is uh, created out of Ta, and there's an emphasis on the heart and the tongue. And for the Egyptians, they thought the heart was the seat of thought. When they knew about the brain, they knew it was important. Uh, we can tell from medical texts and surgeries <laughs> that they did, uh, from we can see on mummies. But they really thought that the heart was the seat of intellect. Um, and so you get a lot of references to that in Egyptian texts. And so, uh, Right, so there's an emphasis uh, also on the mouth itself. He says his Aeneid is before him in teeth and lips, that seed in those hands of Atum, for it is through his seed and his fingers that Atum's Aeneid developed. But the Aeneid is teeth and lips in this mouth that pronounce the identity of everything, and from which Shu and Tefnu emerged and gave birth to the Aeneid. Uh, it goes on a bit longer, but again, emphasizes at the end or repeats it. It's the tongue that repeats what the heart plans. So you have this mentioned a couple of times, right? I meant to underline this too. Uh, pronouncing, speaking. Uh, you have the thought, and then the creation act itself is coming from speaking it. Um, and then the rest of it happens, basically. Um, it creates the rest of the, the idea. And um, this then, in this idea of pronouncement and heart and speech, uh, we can see a parallel for that, of course, uh, in the Bible, and in a couple of places. Uh, also, that the act of naming everything and thereby creating it, that's in the Old Testament. But perhaps really um, obvious is in um, the New Testament, uh, with the whole, the idea of the whole Logos doctrine, right? So the book of John begins with, in the beginning, there was the word. And now in English, that translation word, what they're translating is the word Logos. And word is not a perfect translation of that concept in Greek, not at all. Uh, logos, maybe, especially in this context, is, is best thought of as um, articulated thought, reason, rationality. Um, and it goes on about the word was with God, the word was God, and so on. And I cited these other lines because I wanted to um, emphasize the part about light and darkness, right? Life uh, was the light of all people, and the light shines in the darkness. And we can see parallels there with the, um, the first sunrise of Egyptian creation. Um, so the, um, but the Memphite theology then seems to be the oldest surviving um, example of the type of, kind of intellectual or logos doctrine of creation, as create, of the creation of man as coming some, out of rational thought, a planned, uh, you know, I shouldn't say that, but an actual plan, a rational plan. Uh, which is slightly different than from the Heliopolitan one, but we can see that the authors of this text I just showed you tried to reconcile the two. Okay, so the world's created. <laughs> Let's move on from there. Um, most traditions then have it that the world is uh, ruled. Let me turn the lights back on again. Sorry. I can see, but I guess you guys can't. Um, so the, uh, the reign of Ra is then the first thing that happens. Uh, he rules over everything. And Ra and the, and the kings have a close association. Ra and the institution of kingship. Um, and, and so this is tied up in why then everything begins with the reign of Ra. Um, and this is important to understand because as we're about to look at the myth, 
couple of myths dealing with Ra, we're going to see that it's not all happy days and rainbows and sunshine uh, under the reign of Ra. There's actually a lot of problems. And, uh, you know, contrary to what you might expect, you might expect it to be a golden age. Uh, there, it, it's not. There's no golden age uh, in the very beginning of Egyptian prehistory, as they, as they see it. Uh, and also, Ra is somewhat, sometimes portrayed, as we'll see, as a doddering, uh, you know, a, a doddering person who's not fully in control of everything around him. He's not all knowing. He's not all seeing. Uh, so, well, why is this? And it seems to be that the struggles of Ra in mythology are thus supposed to mirror the struggles of the many kings of Egypt, right? So, if the king of Egypt is an extension of the divine king. Then it raises the question, why does the king have so many problems? Why is there rebellion? Why is he murdered? Uh, and, and so forth. And so one way of explaining that is, well, it was the same for Ra also. Ra had problems too. Uh, these problems have always been around. Which is Ra in that term? He used to go on giving... Um, on the left. Yeah. Uh, the king has never shown the Masha today. The king has never shown like that. But yeah, that's Ra. In the kind of a standard in Ra of midday, right? Ra is a falcon with a sun disk. Um, but I know it might be confusing because often works as shown as a falcon uh, as well. Um, the thing about the, the way we identify gods and so forth in the imagery is through the inscriptions. Um, if there's no inscription, if the inscription's gone, then we have to guess. But um, the inscription is the best way to know exactly who is being represented. Um, so, uh, let's look at uh, two different texts from the reign of Ra uh, that explore kind of different themes. Uh, let's start with the legend of Isis and the true name of Ra, as it's called. And this, this story, this text, I should say this, the text itself from which it comes, is, is a spell. It's a spell for curing a scorpion sting. Um, and it's an example of how mythological stories of the gods are created and harnessed to and used to solve problems. And it seems that in this is a particular genre that from the Middle Kingdom onwards, we get these narrative stories about the gods that are used uh, as part of strategies of healing. Um, and they are performed, they're performative. So you speak them out as well as take some action, as we'll see in, the, in this example, uh, to, in order to secure or restore one's health. Um, and so in this story, the basic, the, basic, um, the basic plot is that Isis forms a snake, a clay snake, uh, that's made from the uh, spits of the aging Ra. And the snake bites Ra and poisons him. Uh, and only Isis can save him. But she will only do this once he reveals his true name to her. Um, which he eventually does do this on the condition that he, she will only share it with her son, Horus. Now, there's probably a lot of questions on there. We're going to unpack them. <laughs> uh, and, but this, the story includes uh, a number of uh, theological and mythological references to the creation, to the nature of God, um, and so on. And then the story is then followed at the end with specific instructions of what the healer is supposed to do uh, in order to help the person who is afflicted uh, by sting. So, first, before we look at the text, let's uh, talk a little bit about Isis herself. I'm sure we've all heard of Isis. Uh, remember, she is the daughter of Geb uh, and Nut. She becomes a wife of Osiris and assists him during his rule. She is the mother of Horus, who will eventually become king and the progenitor of all the Egyptian kings. She, her origins are not very clear, but she's very important, very odd, very early on, we can see. Um, she is generally depicted in a protective or sustaining role, um, and this continues throughout Egyptian history, even when the Greeks and Romans adopt her as, as one of their gods. Um, but she's generally portrayed as immensely powerful, very, very powerful, and especially great in it is she's great in her knowledge of magic. Uh, she uses her magic to revive Osiris, as we'll see tomorrow, uh, and also to conceive and protect Horus, which is a little bit what this myth is about. Um, and magic devices is invoked by Egyptians for healing and protection, and later on by Greek and Roman devotees of Isis as well. Uh, she's typically shown as an anthropomorphic woman, uh, but 
she is sometimes shown with cow horns, probably an attribute that she took on from Hathor, the goddess of love. Uh, Isis becomes preeminent amongst the female goddesses over time and starts to take on some of their attributes as well. So by the time of the Greeks and Romans, she's very much a universal uh, goddess with lots of spheres of influence and power. So the text starts out with uh, telling us it's a spell, a spell of the divine god who came into being by himself. So a reminder or emphasis that he's self-created, I, I point this out because it'll be significant later, uh, who made everything, we got it. Um, and then it introduces Isis uh, and, and her character uh, characteristics. She's a wise woman. Uh, she's very cunning, devious, clever. Uh, She's very exacting. Uh, there's nothing she didn't know in heaven or earth, like Ra, who made the substance of the earth. So she's portrayed, in, in many places, she's portrayed as basically second only to Ra in knowledge about the universe. Uh, the text continues, uh, the age, and they tell us that uh, upon Ra, a divine old age had weakened him. Uh, he cast a spittle to the earth, he spat it out. Isis kneaded it for herself with her hand, uh, she formed it into a noble serpent. So again, it's an allusion to the Heliopolitan tradition, right, about the power of, of the gods, uh, saliva to create. Um, I skipped part of the text, but the god goes out walking, uh, enjoying what he's created, or enjoying his creation, and he gets bitten by the snake. Uh, and then he has a very terrible reaction, and it's described. In fact, it's described multiple times in the text. Uh, and each time the description is a little bit different. Um, and it's described, and what he says here, it's something very painful, but here he doesn't know what's happening, right? He seems to, uh, you know, he didn't see it, he says he didn't make it, I don't, you know, I don't recognize it, I made everything, I didn't make this, what's going on? And um, he's in a lot of pain, and he's gonna tell us this a few times. <laughs> and so then he launches into a speech, um, this is directly after what I just showed you, about who he is. And it's interesting because it seems to be at odds with what we've already seen. He says, I'm a noble, son of a noble, the fluid of a god came forth from a god. I'm a great one, son of a great one. My father thought out my name. I'm on most numerous names and numerous forms. Uh, and he kind of goes on to describe it and goes on to talk about how his name is hidden um, so it can't be used against him. And then he goes on to say, to describe what happened, what just happened. I went outside for a stroll, I got bitten, it's really terrible, I'm on fire, I'm also really cold, this is awful. Uh, so it's the beginning, it seems to be a contradiction, not self-created. But we get the sense here that maybe we're no longer talking about the creator God. Maybe now we're more talking about the person who is trying to identify with the God and who would be using this text. Um, or maybe we're even making now allusions to the kings, right, uh, as well, who of course have um, parents. But there's always this tension. It's not just in um, Egyptian thought, it's in other, uh, uh, other mythological and philosophical traditions as well, of this chicken and the egg problem, right? What came first? If you need two things to, you know, in order to procreate, in, in order to replicate, how did the first thing get here? So we see this tension and contradiction in the texts. Um, Excuse me, is this a modern interpretation or was this actually written? This is the translation. A translation says it was actually written. Yes, so Egypt. everything I put in these little boxes, this is this is a direct translation of the Egyptian text. From the high, high yeah. It was in hieroglyphs, but yes, it's hieratic, which is the cursive script of hieroglyphs. So they didn't write hieroglyphs on papyrus, they wrote, well, they did occasionally, they wrote in a cursive script. Hieroglyphs is for a stone. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, everything I put in these boxes, mm -hmm. this is a translation, not a retelling. Yeah. Would this be accepted by the whole of Egypt? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was definitely accepted by who, whatever tomb that this was in. It was probably a tomb where it was found. Um, but these kind of stories are very common. So, and this one's. This one's from the New Kingdom, um, so definitely some of them. Um, right, so another point in here is the power of the name. And we get that in, again, it's a characteristic of Egyptian thought that there is great power in one's name. Uh, and names are 
an important part of all the rituals. So for all kinds of transfiguration rituals, for going to the afterlife, all spells, using your name is an important part in order to make the spell effective. And we'll see that in this text as well um, in a moment. So um, the children of Ra, several of them rush in to help him, but there's an emphasis on Isis. Isis comes in. She pretends to know nothing, even though this is all her doing. Um, and you know, she says, what's happened? Did a, did a serpent get you? Oh, um, that's too bad. I can help you. Uh, you know, I, I can do this. And then he repeats it one more time, what's happened and his symptoms. Why is that? Well, it's, it's pretty common in oral traditions. We can assume that these tales were told orally again and again before they would ever be written down. Um, and it might be part of the ritual also in terms of making sure that the symptoms are going to be treated, right? Naming the symptoms in order to make sure that they are being, they're going to be banished. Um, you know, the kind of the magic of recitation. And then so he recites the symptoms again. And then she says, I can help you, but you need to tell me your name, your real name. Um, because and she says it kind of in an opaque way. A man lives when one recites his name. Um, when one yeah, recites in his name, the, the incantation. And so Ra kind of does it, but he dodges it. Um, he instead goes on about who he is, right? Which is not the same. He's like, I'm the one who did this, and I did that. I created everything. everything. I created the days. I did all these things. And he says at the end, I'm Capri in the morning, Ra at noon, and at Atom who is in the evening. Uh, but um, Isis isn't by it. Uh, so this, the, the poison is not repelled. And she says, your name is not among the ones you said to me. Tell me your real name. And then there's this extra line in there where it says, the poison burned with the burning. It was more powerful than flame or fire. And it seems to be an emphasis on basically what is Isis's extortion, right? She's extorting her father, making him, her father, her grandfather, uh, making him suffer in order to get this information, one of the few pieces of information that she, she does not have on his true name, and all the power that comes with it. Uh, one question is why? Why is she doing this? And there's a hint at the end. And again, it's a little bit obscure, and it says, Basically, Ra says, okay, I'm going to do it. I'll tell you my name. And he says, if there occurs a similar occasion when a heart goes out to you, say it to your son Horus after you've bound him by a divine oath, placing God in his eyes. The meaning is a little opaque and obscure to us, but it seems to be referencing the myth of one of the stories around Horus when he loses an eye in his battle with Seth. And Isis restores it and heals him. Uh, so... The implication seems to be that what Isis is trying to do is get the name of Ra because it has special power, additional power that she can harness uh, and use to save her son. Or at least that's the general interpretation. Uh, they're not going to explain it out to us. So uh, he gives her his name, but well, we don't get it. The audience doesn't get it. It's not written down. Um, and then she banishes it. Um, she banishes the spell. And this is where we get to the overlap between the story and then the actual person who's using this papyrus. Um, and in the text, there's a blank space. It's not exactly not a blank space. The, um, there's a way that in Egyptian texts, they, uh, they denote where you're supposed to insert your name. And Egyptologists simply translate this with the double letters N. So, and in, in whoever is, um, I said, you recite your name or you recite the name of the person you're helping. So the healer who's doing this would recite this text and then insert the name of the person they're trying to help. And then we're told, here are the, the instructions. The, to the whole thing ends with the instructions. Uh, these words, everything that came above, are to be recited over an image of Atom and Horus of praise. That's a particular manifestation of Horus. A figure of Isis and another image of Horus drawn on the head of Pan the Sufferer. The reason it's in um, capital letters here <laughs> is that the text in the papyrus is different somehow. It's probably red. Uh, red ink instead of black ink. I'm not sure, but there's something different about the text, and so the editor has just put the translation in capital letters to make it clear. Uh, and then there's these instructions about what to do. And so this is a good reminder of how myth is also action, <coughs> as ritual played out. 
Um, and then using the power of these stories and combined with certain actions in order to treat uh, you know, issues of health, issues of um, you know, problems in one's life. Uh, certainly bodily health issues, but it also goes, we, we see spells relating to issues of love or issues of uh, interpersonal relationships between people. Um, any kind of problem in the universe can be addressed with some sort of magical ritual spell like this. And we're told it's this one is for a scorpion sting. So you might wonder, well, if it's for a scorpion sting, why was he bitten by a snake? Well, um, the snake seems to be, in a lot of stories and texts, uh, the snake seems to be a stand-in for all kind of worldly evil uh, in general in these texts. And so he, he, the snake is used a lot, a snake or a serpent, uh, a lot to uh, denote whatever the evil that's being addressed is. Um, at least that's what people, what people think. Um, okay. So, um, there's one other interpretation of this text, and this is a historical or political interpretation. So this text that we have, this version, was from the 19th dynasty. And this is a time um, of disorder and unrest within the ruling house itself. Uh, there's a lot of dynastic squabbles. Uh, there is murder amongst the, amongst, uh, the higher ups. There's conspiracies to murder kings. And it's thought that maybe this is an illusion or an explanation for some of these problems in the dynastic house of a daughter or a queen turning on the father, uh, the king, uh, in order to promote or protect her son. Um, poisons were definitely uh, involved. And so there's one, one interpretation by scholars is that this is an illusion to that, which is going on in the royal family itself. Uh, and trying to explain it, right, in a way that they, you know, will agree with kind of the cosmos and, and the way they perceive the cosmos operating. Um, okay, any, I'm going to move on to the heavenly cow, but before that, any questions about this? <laughs> so many questions. <laughs> yes. um, the, the not naming of the God. Mm. I mean, if you look at Judaism, where God can ne never be named, so right. you refer to as Adonai, is that sort of part of that same uh, well, I mean, oh, is the true name? It might be. I mean, but again, keep in mind, if there's any connection, it's going the other way, right? Because these traditions in Judaism uh, come about later than in Egypt. But and there's certainly lots of influence with the Egyptian thought on uh, philosophical and religious thought in the Levant, so perhaps. But it also maybe is just something that happens organically in different places. I mean, I don't know that much about religious traditions, say, in the Far East, but I'm not sure if they have you might have a similar kind of thing or the power of the name. But you can think about it even today, and like how powerful our, our own names are in terms of, especially when I, when I think about it, it's like I think like when, you know, strangers might call my name, and I think about like when my parents call my name in a certain way, and how that will you know, snap me right into something, right? But if they, but it's when they use my full name, not necessarily, but they gave me, right? Not if they're just trying, you know, they can yell at me, but as soon as they use my full name, I don't know, but at least for me, something kind of, it affects me. Um, so I think that there might be something to that. There's another question? Yeah. How did these incredibly complex relationships which seem to mutate come to be regarded as the truth overall in Egypt? I mean, these incredibly complicated stories hmm. without any evidence whatsoever. I mean, there was no evidence. Well, sorry, evidence this was for the what? Truth. Sorry? Evidence for what? Evidence for these stories. Uh, how did they evolve into becoming the truth to the ancient Egyptians? Oh, they weren't concerned about that. About evidence yes. about the past. Yeah, but how did these stories coalesce into these incredibly complex relationships? I think the same way all folklore emerges in all societies, right? The ancestors tell tales and then they get told, retold, and retold. Is that how it happens? It evolved. As yeah, yeah. I think that's our understanding is that these. So the, the knowledge passed on. The priests will probably have led the evolution of these stories. <laughs> yes, um, keep in mind that there are lots of priests, right? Anyone, almost anyone can be a priest in ancient Egypt, although there are higher priests and lower priests. But yeah, I think, I mean, yeah, in a similar way as all oral traditions, and knowledge gets passed on. This evolves. Yeah, I mean, but keep in mind, in terms of our knowledge of them, it's very haphazard, right? It just happens to be whatever is preserved in a papyrus in some tomb that we happen to find that didn't get destroyed. Right, so um, 
you know, there's, there's tons of, of documents that did not survive, um, not to mention stuff that was probably never written down. So what we see is a very, very, I would say, like a huge jigsaw puzzle with only a handful of pieces. Um, so you know, we make the connections as much as we can, but as I just kind of suggested in interpreting this, we're, we're guessing a lot of times, right? We're trying to draw inferences, compare with other traditions and texts, and try and guess the meaning. And that's why you know, Egyptology and, and as a field, you know, there's always new information and new publications. As we find new texts or we think about things differently, people come up with new interpretations. So it evolved for them, and it's evolving for us too, I guess is the point. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's look at another text, the so-called Book of the Heavenly Cow. It's not a book, <laughs> not a physical book, um, but it's, it is one of these so-called underworld books, like the Book of the Dead, the Book of the Andalot. Uh, it's, it's a text, um, but we just call it a book out of convention's sake. And it's one of these funerary books um, that was inscribed in uh, tombs. So tombs of kings, some of the kings, especially in the New Kingdom, also some people who weren't kings as well. And it is, uh, I should say about half of it, the mythological story part, describes a part of the creation saga when the sun god abandons the earth because of human wickedness. Um, the other half is a series of spells. And these spells basically allow for the departure of the deceased from this realm to follow the sun god into the realm beyond. So the Avakarnath whole idea or purpose of the book is that uh, much like the sun god, um, the deceased, in, in this case, this exact example, the, gods, uh, the king, Sai, he doesn't die, he's just going someplace else, uh, if you will, to the great beyond. Um, but we do have this mythological narrative uh, within it, and it's, it's quite interesting. Um, and it's a bit long, so I won't be putting quite as much text up, um, but just some of the highlights. So it begins. Um, once it came to pass, under the majesty of Ra, the self-generated god, uh, there it is again, uh, that when he had been in kingship over mankind and the gods combined, mankind proceeded to contrive a plot. Uh, now that he had grown old, uh, his bones being of silver, his flesh of gold, and his hair of genuine lapis lazuli. Um, the gods are often um, described as being made of these precious materials, uh, precious elements of, of the earth. Uh, his majesty became aware of the plot, uh, and so he decided to call a council and make a plan, and he summons uh, his eye, I'll come back to the eye in, in a couple of slides, don't worry, uh, Shu, Tafnu, and a whole bunch of people, including Nun, the primordial waters too. Uh, and so Ra says to Nun, uh, you're the oldest one in whom I originated, uh, and also you other ancestral gods, uh, mankind has been trying to fight against me, tell me what to do, help me out, give me a solution. Um, and so they say to him, they give him some advice, they say, send out your eye, then it might smite them for you. Those who have conspired so wickedly, no eye is as capable as to smite them for you. Uh, may it descend in the form of Hathor. I'll come back to that. Uh, and then, so it, this happens. So the eye goddess goes out in the form of Hathor, we're told, and then she returns, and it says she's slain mankind. Um, but what's clear is that she hasn't slain all of mankind. She seems to have just slain a portion of it, and she's gotten tired of just coming back from that. And the god says, welcome back. Did you accomplish what you set out to do? And she says, yes. It was agreeable. It was great. Um, but then, I think the, the text is a little weird, but it's, what's very clear is that the the god, Ra, he changes his mind. He's like, hmm, okay, but you know what? I'm going to gain power over them. Hold off decimating them. Just, just stop. <laughs> now, and then at the, at the end of the line, right after that, in a slightly different um, ink, uh, we get in this different, slightly different kind of, um, you know, what we would do in italicized to make it indicate it's, it's, it's a different form of text. It says, and so Sekhmet came into being. So one of the things that's going on with this text is that it's providing a series of explanations, uh, etiologies, for certain aspects of the divine realm uh, and the world as well. And one of these is the creation of the goddess Sekhmet, who is personification of um, destructive rage. Uh, the word Sekhmet means literally to be powerful. 
and she is very powerful. Uh, as kind of the counterpart and the opposite of love, right? So she was sent out as half war, but in doing this, now we've created this new goddess, Sekhmet. Sekhmet is um, represented a lot in the New Kingdom. Maybe that happens to be because the kings of the New Kingdom are out conquering a lot <laughs> and killing people a lot, especially people in uh, you know, Israel and so forth. But um, so she's often shown as statues in the New Kingdom and shown as a woman but with the head of a lion, right? So with that kind of fero ferocious destructive power that a lion has. Now what about the eye? What is this eye? The eye shows up, the eye sends out. Well, divine eyes are quite important in Egyptian mythology and thought, especially those of the most powerful gods like Ra and Horus. Um, and the eye of Ra in particular is generally personified as a goddess, and it can be sent out to do things. The thing is, it also has its own agency and will, and sometimes the eye gets upset with Ra in other stories and just takes off and has its own adventures. Um, and so it's a little bit, so you can't entirely control it, which is part of what we're going to see happens next. Um, but it's, it's, it's divine moral power at its most fierce, at its most brutal, right? Um, and it represents the god's power in action. And for that reason, then, of course, the divine eyes can take on a protective uh, form as well, right? Uh, and that's why we get all these eye amulets uh, that are found all the time in ancient Egyptian material culture. Um, the one that you see probably most common, you see back to the Wajit eye, is the eye of Horus. But it's, it's, it's similar in spirit to the eye of Ra. Um, and it, it's used for a form of protection. So, and, but in this story, the Eye of Ra is sent down to obliterate humanity because he's been wicked and they are rebelling. Um, but he can't entirely be controlled. Um, and so what we're told is that Ra has a change of heart. He says on the line I just showed you earlier, also gave power over them as king. Um, kind of, we interpret that as the kind of institution of kingship being, of a human kingship is going to be enacted for and he says, a little bit further down, I shall preserve mankind from her. Um, the eye has its own agency. Sacrament's power is so great. It's not a symbol of the matter of just telling her to stop. Like, she's got a mission. She's going to do it. Um, so he comes up with a plan. Rob comes up with a plan. And it, it, is, it is really what it says there. You can read it in the text if you don't believe me um, <laughs> that I posted. Uh, Rob brews a whole bunch of beer. Because beer is a staple of the Egyptian diet. And it's not quite beer like we have today. It's more of a kind of, I don't want to say porridge, but it's more substantial than that. And it's very nutritious. Um, so he brews up this huge batch of beer and gets a bunch of ochre dye and dyes it red. And he gets up early in the middle of the night before Sakhmet wakes up again. And he goes and he spreads it out all over the fields. He dumps it out everywhere. And so then the eye goddess wakes up she sets out in the morning and sees it. She is, we're told, she's delighted. Um, uh, she proceeds to drink it uh, and thought it was just grace. <laughs> uh, but she came back so drunk, she couldn't recognize humanity anymore. So basically, in order to thwart her, uh, he got her drunk. So she couldn't actually carry out her mission. Uh, now, this seems like a kind of silly story, but again, it has a purpose. It's an explanation for a particular festival known as the Feast of Hathor that takes place every year, which involves heavy levels of intoxication. Um, so where did that, why, where did these festivals come from? Oh, it goes back to the time when man was wicked and, and, and when Ra saved, but then Ra decided to save mankind from his own wrath, right? And, and this might sound somewhat familiar, right? We have certain echoes of that in Old Testament's ideology as well, of this wicked humanity, and God wanted to destroy it, but decided to save it, um, you know, for slightly different reasons. So then, um, but after that, though, so humanity's been saved, but Ra has had enough. He says, as I live for myself, my heart is too weary to remain with them, humans. Uh, you know, otherwise, basically, they're going to drive me to kill them. If I stay here, I'm going to kill them, is what he said. I've, I've got to go. And the gods kind of object at first. They're like, no, no, you still have power. You can, you can make this work. Uh, and he's like, no, no. You know, it's going to be another. It's going to be another one. It's going to be another conspiracy and another conspiracy. It's too much. 
Um, and so none comes up with a plan. The text is a little broken here, but based on other texts, other versions of the story and the illustrations, we can see what happens. He, he instructs his daughter, Newt, the sky, to carry Ra to this new world, this new realm. Um, and she does so in the form of a cow. Uh, and why, again, the reasoning isn't really clear, but we do know that in the text he says, don't be silly, and, um, sorry, this should be, oh, right, so sorry, Newt says, don't be silly to none, but then she becomes a cow. Uh, but the thing is, the word cow and silly come from the same roots. So again, it seems to be a linguistic connection. So you just have to accept that. She becomes a cow. Um, we'll come back to the cow uh, in a moment. But um, before Ra goes, he starts making uh, arrangements uh, for what's going to happen after he leaves. He makes instructions. So he, um, well, sorry, first he separates the realms. So he creates Newt as the daytime and nighttime skies. And maybe you're thinking, wait, we thought that Newt was already surrounded, uh, separated as the sky. And this is what I, this is an example of what I'm talking about, about conflicting stories and traditions kind of having to just get along with each other. So this is a bit different version of how a new becomes a sky. Um, he also creates different planes of existence. He creates the planets and stars, so he creates the celestial realm, and he creates the field of rushes, which is the idyllic afterlife that Egyptians are all trying to get to. Um, and then he also creates the infinite ones. I remember them, they're the ones who are gonna help hold up the sky. He also makes some assignments to the gods. So he calls in Geb, and he says, Geb, you're the earth, you're in charge of the earth, you've gotta take care of the snake problem. Uh, there's snakes everywhere, they are agents of chaos, you need to keep a handle on them, because they're, they're causing problems with the people. Um, and so again, it's with the, you know, the snake is a general standing for destructive forces, it's destructive chaotic forces in the universe. Um, and then he also gives assignments to God, and we get the introduction of, of, of sorry, of Thoth, and we get the introduction of Thoth as a deity. Um, and he says to Thoth, you will do writing there, you will be reason, and you will calm the people down. Um, these rebellious people, uh, he called, and they're referred to as the earth gods, if you will, but what that means is humans. Um, follows, followers of this irascible one. It's thought that it's a reference, perhaps, Seth, as the embodiment of chaos. You are to be in my place, my vicar. Thus shall be called Thoth, the vicar of Ra. And the text goes on, and again, I encourage you to look at it, and he talks about his different forms. Uh, that one that one form is going to be an ibis, um, and that another form is going to be a baboon, and specifically a baboon for someone who can, as, as an entity that can chase off enemies. Uh, baboons, and they're aggressive, um, they're aggressive characteristic. And then also, perhaps most importantly, his association with the moon. Um, is it on there? No, sorry, I meant to put some notes. Uh, but he, his association with the moon. So Thoth becomes an embodiment of the moon as well. Um, and the idea is, is that that's the sun god standing, or it's a representation of the sun god standing in at night. Right, that's how they perceive the moon. So the sun disappears. Well, what's that, what's that circle in the sky at night that changes from a crescent to a circle? Um, that's, uh, that's the sun that's still coming through, connecting between the two celestial realms. Um, and Thoth, is then given responsibility for taking that form. Um, and that's why Thoth is often associated with the moon. So this is why we get images of Thoth uh, as a baboon, and often with then the moon and sun disk combined. He's connecting those two worlds on behalf of the sun god, because the sun god has taken off. Um, so the rest of the text are spells and actions for the deceased to carry out um, in his spiritual form. Uh, in order to complete the transfiguration and follow the sun god into the great beyond. And that's the point of the myth, it has several points. Um, first of all, it serves as a, a divine precedent for the king leaving the earth for the sky. Why do kings die? They follow in the footsteps of, of, of the sun god. Um, the stories also uh, provide um, different roles for the gods. Uh, establishes different roles and responsibility of the gods that the Egyptians have come to know and explains them how they came to be. Um, and then also the text explains the existence of evil as a characteristic of humanity and outside of divine control. Much like in Christianity, much like in other 
belief systems, there's always this question, this, this problem of why is evil exist in the world? If the gods are all powerful, if they're essentially good, then why is there evil? And so um, there's two ways the Egyptians do it. One is that they show that there's just chaos in the world that the gods have to contend with. They are stronger and they're in a better position to fight with it, but they still have to contend with it. Another way of explaining it is that evil originates in mankind. And this is kind of complementary. Uh, evil originates in mankind in a way that the gods simply cannot banish um, because of this kind of you know, overarching chaotic force that exists in the universe. Um, and there was some debate about this in Egyptian thought. Um, some people challenged this orthodoxy and thought, well, why is there evil? Why don't the gods, especially in times of strife and destruction and famine and war, uh, we get to ask the question, why aren't the gods, why aren't the kings curing this? And then the answer often is, well, it's mankind who's doing this to themselves. Um, mankind has the ability to not be evil. They have to choose to. So the text also um, then reinforces that idea. Um, OK, so yes, that's it for today. So that's, sorry, I <laughs> this here. So that's the reign of Ra for today. Tomorrow, what we're going to do then, after the god, after Ra leaves, what happens is some other gods rule for a little while, but then eventually it's Osiris. But Osiris gets murdered by Seth, and then it's a problem. So we will um, we will explore that saga tomorrow and its implications, especially you know for the way that the um, Egyptians looked at the afterlife and the idea of rebirth and, and all of that. Uh, but in the meantime, of course, I will happily take more questions. Thank you. Yes. The gods and the goddesses, are they all individuals, or is, is there some defining characteristics, or what differentiates a god from a goddess? Well, they do seem to be gendered. Um, so certain. Um, I and mean, remember the gods are personifications, basically of forces. Um, but sometimes it seems like the, they are given, they are made women because the concept itself will be a feminine noun. So linguistically, the concept is feminine. So then um, it'll have feminine goddess. Um, other things just to be, seem to be associated with women. So a lot of the powers of destruction and love, uh, you know, destruction as a defense, right? Because that's often what Sekhmet is. She's destroying in defense of Egypt in defense of the king. It's a protective destruction. Um, so those are often associated with motherhood, and that's why also it's associated with the lion. Um, because the lions, lionesses, I should say, because a lioness will do anything to protect their young, mothers will do anything to protect their children. So certain features of them, these certain divine powers, are associated specifically with women, that is what I'm trying to say. Um, other, but other reasons, for other reasons, we don't really know why they've chosen it to be a goddess or a god. Um, arithmetic, the goddess of arith um, the, the deity of arithmetic is also a goddess. Um, but you know, then, but there's a lot of overlapping. So the, the second answer to your question is, since these gods are coming from all these different places and all these different traditions, there's often a, a lot of overlapping and blending, which scholars call syncretism. So a very good example of that would be the god I have not mentioned at all, but maybe some of you have heard of, Amun-Ra, right? So who's heard of Amun-Ra? Yeah, most people. So Amun, as a god, was a god of Thebes, a city of Thebes in the south. Um, and then what happens is that in a certain period of Egypt's history, after a period of um, political decentralization, everything is reunified again by a single dynasty, and that dynasty comes from Thebes. Uh, whereas the previous dynasties in the Old Kingdom had come from the North. So that dynasty comes from Thebes, and they have their own god, right? Uh, so Amun. But then Ra is already pretty preeminent. Um, but they're trying to kind of work on their position and make their, you know, their family, their city more preeminent. So what happens is that Amun and Ra get merged and created in this new deity, Amun-Ra. There's still Amun and there's still Ra, but then there's this combination Amun-Ra which maybe doesn't make a lot of sense to us, but it makes it works for them, if that makes sense. So there's a lot of fluidity, and it changes over time in different place, you know, over 3,000 years. Is this a process of evolution on one year to the next? No, I mean, just 
you know, things change over time. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily call it evolution, like progress. It's just over time, things change, right? Culture changes, people's perceptions changes, the realities on the ground changes, politics change. So, I mean, 